Good morning, and welcome to today's show. I'm your host, historian Edna Friedberg. During the Holocaust, the Nazis performed inhumane, supposedly medical experiments in the name of science on thousands of people they deemed inferior. Most of their victims died as a result. Today, we will commemorate Disability Awareness Month by sharing the stories of a group of women who survived brutal abuse at the hands of concentration camp doctors and were left with lifelong disabilities. Throughout their ordeal, they resisted the Germans, and they continued to defy their oppressors by testifying about the abuse after the war. Please join me in welcoming my friend and colleague, Dr. Patricia Haberer Rice, Senior Historian at the Museum, who will help us unpack this chapter in Holocaust history. Good morning, Patricia. Good morning, Edna. It's great to see you. We are so glad that you are here, and we hope that people watching will post questions for you in the chat, and we'll get to as many of them live as we can during the course of the show. So, Patricia, introduce us to the people we're talking, us, talking about today. Tell us how a number of Polish Catholic women caught the attention of Germans at the beginning of World War II. Right. After Germany invaded Poland in September 1939, a number of Polish girls and women began to resist the Nazis. Some young Polish women became girl guides. Uh, here in the United States, we call them Girl Scouts. This international organization grew out of the scouting movement in the early 20th century. And during World War II, Girl Guides played a really important part in many European countries, running scrap metal and rubber drives, digging bomb shelters, training as telegraphers and signalers. And in Poland, some Girl Guides took care of children in nurseries and summer camps or they perform domestic duties like cooking and laundry to support resistance fighters. Others risk their lives to take on more dangerous roles as couriers, or bringing important information to Jews imprisoned in ghettos or even rescuing or hiding Jews. It's really interesting to me and reminds me when you're talking about scouting, that scouting was also critical to Jewish resistance of those people you're describing in the ghettos, right. uh, networks of people who already know each other, trust each other. Um, the kinds of tasks that you're describing are, is very, very dangerous work. What happened to these women if they were caught by the German occupiers? In Poland, where uh, German occupation was extremely brutal, uh, they were given a very harsh prison sentence when they, go, they were caught and were often subjected to interrogation under torture. And the women we'll discuss today were caught and eventually transferred to Ravensbrück concentration camp. You see that there. It's located just 50 miles outside of Berlin and ended up being one of the largest concentration camps for women during the Holocaust. An estimate suggests that as many as 132,000 women were imprisoned at that camp from roughly 1939 until May of 1945 when the war ends in Europe. And at this time uh, that we're talking about, there were almost no Jewish prisoners at Ravensbrück. There were about 40 different nationalities there, and roughly one third of the women were Christian Poles. And the conditions were horrendous. The camp was crowded and unsanitary. They had very little food. Some female prisoners at Ravensbrück were forced to work uh, 12 hours a day, six days a week. Uh, they were subjected to solitary confinement, beatings. A select group endured even more extreme and cruel treatment from the Nazis, perhaps because of their role in the resistance. So let's learn more about that group of young women in particular, um, people who came to be known as the rabbits. That's a, a seemingly kind of cute name, but what, what is it about? Now, although this nickname sounds cute, right? It really belies a darker truth. In addition to being forced labor, some young women who'd been active in the Polish resistance were compelled to become test subjects, if you will, of Nazi medical experiments, those infamous medical experiments. And these began in Ravensbrück in the summer of 1942. And uh, they were kept in the dark about what was going to be done to them. In many cases, they were given anesthesia and uh, put to sleep. And when they woke, they discovered they'd been mutilated by the doctors working at Ravensbrück. And one Polish woman, Wanda Poltawska, uh, well, Poltawska uh, confronted one of the doctors in German. She said, ich bin kein Kind, ich bin Mensch, uh, meaning I'm not a rabbit, I'm a human being. And the German use of rabbit in this context is like we would use the word guinea pig, suggesting uh, animals used for laboratory experiments. And word got out and the name rabbit stuck. 
Uh, after that, all of the women subjected, subjected to medical experiments at Robinsbrook were nicknamed rabbits by everyone in the camp. And uh, long after the war, women who survived these very grisly experiments still referred to themselves as rabbits or le pain in French. Uh, they felt that they, doing so would remind people that they had been treated as lab animals by the Nazis during the war. So they didn't want this experience to be forgotten. And we'll hear more about that in a minute. But I'd like to pause to uh, welcome our audience and let you know, Patricia, where people are watching from. Good morning uh, to people watching us from Gastonia, North Carolina, Oxford, Mississippi, Tullahoma, Tennessee, North Ogden, Utah, and El Dorado, Texas. And welcome to international viewers uh, in Bogota, Colombia, San Juan, Puerto Rico. We hope you have power and are safe there. <laughs> Um, in the UK, uh, Roma, Italy, and Saskatoon, Canada. So thank you for joining us. Patricia, uh, we have a comment sort of question from a viewer named Arturo who says, I don't understand how human beings accept and collaborate in the torture and extinction of another human being. Patricia, who made the decision to do uh, these kind of mutilating procedures in the name of science and what kinds of experiments were being carried out at Robinsbrook? The ringleader of these experiments at Robinsbrook was Dr. Karl Gebhardt. He was a respected German surgeon. He was working in a clinic just a few miles from Robinsbrook. And so he was very happy to have these available text uh, subjects, really victims, if you will, uh, close by with no restrictions on how he could treat them or handle them. And Gephardt was the main coordinator for a series of experiments involving medical uh, management, surgical management of traumatic wounds. He orders experiments at Robinsbrook to simulate wounds and injuries that German troops might encounter in the field. Physicians there conducted procedures on prisoners that involved unnecessary bone transplants, removing nerves and tissue, and testing of uh, pharmaceuticals for treatment. And I understand that one of the experiments that Dr. Gephardt ordered involved the testing of sulfa drugs, a uh, kind of antibiotic. Why was Dr. Gephardt interested in this particular drug, and how and did he and other doctors with whom he worked at Robinsbrook uh, try to test it, or at least ostensibly test it? Well, this is a really fascinating story. Gebhardt was the personal physician to Heinrich Himmler, who was head of the SS, very high up in the Nazi administration. And in May 1942, Himmler sent Gebhardt to Prague to treat Reinhard Heydrich, one of the architects of the final solution, uh, the Nazis' plan to murder the Jews of Europe. And Heydrich had just survived an assassination attempt by Czech resistance. Uh, they'd rolled a bomb under his car and Heydrich came away uh, alive, but with shards from the seat in his back and backside. And he dies a few later of sepsis, then called blood poisoning. So he dies from infection. And now Gebhardt's in really hot water with Nazi officials because he had refused to try and treat Heydrich with what was called sulfonilamide, an early antibacterial sulfa drug. So now bizarrely, Gebhardt wants to experiment with sulfa drugs on Ravensbrück prisoners, perhaps in this strange effort to dismiss the efficacy of antibiotics of, of sulfa drugs. These experiments were extremely gruesome. Physicians created gangrenous infections by cutting open the, usually the leg of the victim and inserting dirt, glass, bark, and other foreign materials into the wound to try and induce infections and then watch them progress. And some patients were treated with the sulfa drug while others were left untreated as part of a control group. Really just horrifying, horrifying uh, procedures and torture. Um, I mean, as you've described, Kep Gephardt may have had a particular personal no motive to try to save his reputation, shed some light on how sulfa drugs perform, but there also seems to have been a strong element of sadism in all of these procedures, um, just so cruel. Patricia, we are getting some comments or questions about uh, having to obey orders uh, with someone writing in saying, it's unfortunate that this has come to pass. Obey orders from a dictator, very sad. Either you obey or die. But is that really true for Gephardt? Is he following any kind of order? No, this is a crime of opportunity. It's a chance for him to petition to have these concentration camp prisoners as test subjects rather than doing, uh, you know, what's normally 
expected in human experimentation uh, with very high um, medical ethics involved. And obviously these are not. And we know the dirty little secret of the Holocaust is that nobody really pays with their lives or limb for um, participating in this kind of activity. So we've been introduced to some of the perpetrators, but I'd like to get to know one of the women who were targeted by these horrible procedures. Um, how did a woman named Yadviga Jido end up at Ravensbrück? Who was she? Yeah, Yadviga, Yadviga Jido was a 21-year-old Polish Catholic pharmacy school student. She was studying at the University of Warsaw. She had a promising career. Uh, working at a local pharmacy when the German army invaded Poland. That would be on September 1st, 1939. And Jadwiga joins the Polish resistance and offers her skills as a pharmacist. That's really important to the resistance movement because she can obtain medication and administer first aid. Uh, the Gestapo learns of her clandestine activities and they arrest Jadwiga in March of 1941. And for weeks, she's interrogated and beaten. And at one point, Jadwiga is transferred to the Lublin Castle, which was a prison controlled by the Nazi, by the German security police and security service. That's sort of the intelligence wing of the SS. And during the course of the German occupation of Poland, that Lublin prison held about 40,000 prisoners, and most of them were political prisoners, uh, resistance fighters like Jadwiga. And, after being held there for nearly six months in miserable conditions, Jadwiga is transported in September 41 uh, to Ravensbrück. Uh, she's forced to wear a red badge. The color indicates red that she's a political prisoner and that P on that badge shows that she's a Polish prisoner. And Jadwiga became known as prisoner 7860. Obviously the numbers are way to dehumanize her, to take away her name. And once there at the camp as this prisoner with a number, with a badge, Jadwiga was enslaved on a forced labor detail for more than a year, but then she was ordered to report for a, a very vague new assignment. How did Jadwiga fall victim to the Nazi medical experiments? What happened to her? Yeah, right. So in November of 1942, Jadwiga is ordered to show up at the infirmary at Robinsbrook. And doctors there told her to undress, she's x-rayed, she's uh, examined, she recalls being given something to drink and taken to the operating room. And without her knowledge, let alone, of course, her consent, Jadwiga has been selected to be part of this sulfa drug experiment. And the doctors cut open her completely healthy leg and deliberately infected the wound as they did for all sulfa drug experiments at Robinsbrook. And after the surgery, Jadwiga woke up with a bandage on her leg and with what she called an indescribable pain and splitting, burning uh, sensation in her feet, a terrible pain. Even though her wound became infected and Jadwiga became very ill, she was given no medication to treat it. So she was seemingly in a control group probably for the, for the experiment. She developed a very high fever and passed in and out of consciousness. And it took Jadwiga almost six months after the surgery to heal enough to be able to walk without crutches. It's just hard to believe that this kind of, of suffering, of injury, of life-threatening infection was inflicted by Anya Dvika by medical professionals, people who are supposed to be in the healing business. Um, and again, the, the pretext for this is that the doctors supposedly wanted to watch what happened because maybe they would gain information that would benefit how they would treat German soldiers wounded in battle. So they're, they're simulating battle wounds. Correct. Patricia, even though women like Jadwiga were severely weakened by these procedures, by these experiments, they still found ways to resist. Tell us how some of them managed to very, very against odds uh, document the abuse that they were experiencing. Yeah, we shouldn't be surprised that these women remain defiant. They were there precisely because they were resisting German occupation of Poland, uh, which, remember, a very brutal occupation. In the fall of 1944, Nazi Germany suppressed an uprising in Warsaw, uh, backed by the Polish Home Army, that's the army of the, the Poles, uh, in occupation. And they deported the Germans, a large number of prisoners that they took from the uprising to Ravensbrück. Uh, one of these new prisoners had a camera and traded it for bread. And this camera got in the hands of Johanna Sudolska. 
uh, another victim of the Nazis medical experiments. And in October of 1944, she took secret photos of women subjected to this abuse we've been describing by the doctors at the camp. She risked her life and the lives of her subjects to take these clandestine photos behind one of the barracks at Robinsbrook. And we have a viewer question from a woman named Magda. She was wondering about how we had uh, photographs like this. Patricia, sometimes when we have camp photos, they are very rarely taken by prisoners. This is unusual, right? Very, very unusual and very dangerous, as I've just said. Um, the, for the Nazis part, it was taboo to take photographs within concentration camps and killing centers. And of course, cameras would have been confiscated from Jews a long time before they arrived or other prisoners uh, when they arrived at these camps. And so the fact that they were able to, and had the foresight, right, to, to document the crimes that were being perpetrated upon them uh, with probably obviously an idea to uh, pursue some justice in the post-war and to get this news out to, to the allies um, is really remarkable, I think. Absolutely remarkable. Um, let's actually have a look at a couple of these extraordinary secret photos and they are very disturbing. Tell us a little bit about a woman named Bogumila Babinska. Right, so Bogumila Babinska in my Polish, uh, underwent experimentation too at, at Robinsbrook. Although this photo is taken at a distance, you can see the scar on her right thigh. Doctors needlessly operated on her twice, lacerating the muscles in her leg. Not evident in this photo is the cut on Bogomilia's uh, shin bone, which caused severe pain and a high fever. And despite that pain, she was forced to work uh, 12 hours a day, knitting socks for German soldiers. But that didn't stop Bogomila from resisting. And um, prisoners at Robinsburg were allowed to write one letter each month to family members. Remember, they're not Jews, they're, um, they're Gentile prisoners. So they're allowed one letter a month to their family members. And we understand that in 1943, Bogomila and a few of her close friends began including illegal, invisible messages written in urine uh, about the medical experiments and the women being abused. It's a primitive way actually to make invisible ink and write between the lines of their letters to their families. And this contents were sent to underground leaders in Lublin and Warsaw, the Polish capital, and the Polish government sitting in exile in London. And eventually these letters make their way to the International Committee of the Red Cross and even to the Vatican. It's absolutely astonishing ingenuity. Uh, and again, a risk to try to send this testimony out to the world any way that they could while they are still undergoing this abuse. Okay. Um, let's look at another secret photo taken in Ravensbrook. This one uh, is of a woman named Maria Kuzmierczuk. Yeah, uh, a year after Maria arrived at Ravensbrook, Nazi doctors infected her leg with tetanus bacteria. Like so many other women subjected to these experiments, she wakes up in pain with her leg bandage, not knowing what had happened to her. Soon after, she develops a very high fever and a severe infection. And she's given numerous injections afterwards. They don't tell her what that was, but I'm guessing uh, from the fact that she didn't suffer from this terrible convulsions that tetanus brings on, that was probably the sulfa drug. And these photos show her bulging wound. And we'll discuss in a bit, Maria's defiance of the Nazis continues after the war when she describes to a court how the wound never healed and how the bone in her leg remained exposed. These are disabling, disfiguring wounds. Patricia, we have a couple of different people writing in. Alex is asking and Brett is asking if any positive results came from these kind of Nazi experiments. And I know that you know a lot about uh, Nazi scientists and doctors, so even beyond Ravensbrück. Um, what information was gleaned and uh, is it ethical to use it? Right. It's hard to tell what was gleaned from this. Many of these experiments, of course, are of no value because they're terribly skewed. You have very traumatized, uh, very undernourished um, uh, victims as so-called test subjects. So a lot of this information was is badly skewed. This is These are not proper experiments in many cases. The other thing is that the testing for pharmaceuticals was often done by large 
corporations like Bayer or Bayer, the kind, the people who make the aspirin, right? Bayer aspirin. And we don't really know how much of this material was incorporated in their research and development of pharmaceuticals. Uh, the really good question is, Edna, as you just said, uh, is it ethical to use it? And there are strict guidelines on this from um, the different medical associations since World War II, the German Medical Association, the American Medical Association. Uh, and you cannot use the material that's been gleaned from these experiments unless there's no other way to treat um, uh, the, the, the issue at hand. And then this must be very carefully documented about where this information came from and why it's being used. So very strict uh, medical ethics controls on the use of these things. And by now, most of this um, information that would have been gleaned in the 1940s, we, science is outstripped it. So I doubt that it's used anymore. Very complicated. Um, knowing that this was very doc dangerous to document though, and I'd like to return to the secret photos, how in the world did they protect this film and how do we actually have the photos today? It's one thing to take it, but <laughs> they weren't uh, immediately photographs. So after Johanna uh, took the photographs, they got rid of the camera, they ditched it, but they kept the film hidden in the barracks, barracks 32, we know where they lived for about half a year. And on April 23rd, 1945, the Swedish Red Cross, remember Sweden's a neutral country, so they were able to gain entrance uh, to Robinsbrook and rescue some prisoners. And one of the prisoners that they take away is a French resistance prisoner, Germaine Tillon, and she took the film with her. She develops it in Paris after the war, and later she writes a seminal eyewitness account about Robinsbrook and the rabbits. And that book is of course, she's French, so it was written in French. So you often hear the rabbits being described as le pain, uh, French for rabbit, and that's because of Germaine Tillon's work. And uh, Germaine Tillon, she herself, Tillon, was not uh, one of the lapins, though she documented them. Um, but I'm curious about survival rates because these experiments were so barbaric, so dangerous, it's hard to imagine that anyone could have survived. What do we know about uh, what happened to those women? We know there were at least 70 Polish women who were victims of these experiments. Again, they're Polish Christian women, most of them Polish Catholics. Uh, we think that there were some women from other nationalities involved, but we don't know their identities. Um, out of this Polish group of 70, 74, I think is the exact number, five died of their injuries and six were murdered at Robinsbrook. Um, by... Uh, February 4th, 1945, Robinsbrook authorities planned to murder the uh, victims of experimentation to hide any evidence of their crime. Remember, the uh, Red Army is coming from the East, the Americans are coming from the West uh, and British. So they want to uh, hide any evidence of their crimes. And a variety of factors help keep these women from harm or at least alive. And most of them are young and healthy before they came to Robinsbrook. And as resistance figures, they have a really tremendous will to survive. They all were also nurtured and nurtured one another. Polish prisoners actually set up an assistance committee and they assign a mother for each one of these rabbits to look after them and take care of them. And Jadwiga's friends, for instance, help her stay from uh, hidden from the authorities, which probably saved her life. Other rabbits were able to hide among the general prisoner population, thanks to the cooperation of the other inmates uh, of Ravensbrück, who all helped each other, apparently. And when the Soviet army got too close to the camps, uh, they sent them, along with other prisoners, all of these victims of the experimentation, uh, on a death march, what we call a death march. And despite their injuries, they have to walk for days uh, without food or water. And these death marches were absolutely lethal. Uh, those who couldn't keep up were simply shot. And it's a miracle that these women survived. Absolutely astonishing portrait of resilience, but also clearly these, uh, these bonds, this cohesive community that they created uh, literally sustained many of them. Um, we're talking about these medical experiments at Robinsbrook in particular, but there were other uh, doctors and scientists who conducted experiments elsewhere. And a viewer named Cindy is asking Patricia, she's saying this is so horrific, 
so very brave. Are there statistics on how many died from experiments? Can you quickly give us a sense more broadly about what was happening? Right. So we know of experimentation very famously in many, many camps across the uh, concentration camp system, uh, most famously at Dachau uh, by the German Air Force and at Auschwitz, as well as here at Ravensbrück. And we they used to think there were about 100,000 victims. We know now through the work of Paul Weindling and others that it was probably closer to about 20,000 and about 8,000 die of their injuries, uh, directly as a result of their injuries. We don't know how many uh, individuals succumb later in life because of this experimentation. So um, a tragic story. And some are people who are disabled also exactly. as a result of this. Some are selected for experiments because they already had disabilities, some okay. because they're twins. So there are a variety of different, different uh, settings and contexts. Uh, an, another viewer uh, named Melody is commenting on the rabbits, saying they were very brave under such horrific circumstances. I hope they were able to see those butchers receive punishment for their crimes. What happened to those who survived after liberation and what happened to those who had abused them so terribly? So after the war ended, a number of the victims of the Nazi experiments at Ravensbrück agreed to testify against these, a group of high-ranking doctors during the Nuremberg doctors' trial. That's a, one of the first subsequent Nuremberg trials uh, held by an American military tribunal in 1946. And um, we, I think, we're, there we go, we're looking at footage from this trial of two women we discussed early in the program, Maria Kuzmirschuk and Jadwiga Zido. And you can see that they're showing their wounds to the court while an expert physician testifies about the irreparable damage that was done to each of them. And along with the horrors of experimentation, Yadviga described in her testimony what it was like to be a prisoner at Ravensbrück. She says, we were told each day, every day, that we were nothing but numbers. Remember the badge that we had to forget that we were human beings. We we're not allowed to smile. We were not allowed to cry or pray. We were not allowed to defend ourselves when we were beaten. Uh, but these women's brave testimony helped convict 16 physicians of war crimes and crimes against humanity at the doctor's trial. And a woman named Andrea is writing in to say, that uh, these women, these people were incredibly brave to, after having gone through all of this, testify against the people who did the damage to them. And Andrea, uh, of course, have to agree. I mean, in this case, they are literally putting their own bodies, entering them into evidence as exhibits in a court case um, that is uh, very vulnerable, um, very um, upsetting, I think, to, to do, very personal. Patricia, how did doctors like Carl Gephardt, and actually he was brought to trial at this uh, Nuremberg courtroom, how did they defend their crimes and their abuses when they were confronted by the women at the trial? Right. So Carl Gephardt then is among 23 of these very high-ranking physicians tried at Nuremberg. Uh, the trial lasts from 1946 to 47. And when he testifies, Gephardt is He's, he's not, you know, lashing about in a very dramatic way, proclaiming his innocence. He talks in a very detached clinical manner. And uh, he showed no remorse for endangering and permanently disabling vulnerable human beings in the names, in the name rather of, of medical science. He still was a devoted supporter of the Nazi party. And he seemed to feel that he was justified as to what he had done. And we actually have some film footage from the courtroom uh, of Gephardt when the, the verdict is announced from his trial. Let's have a look. Carl Gephardt, Military Tribunal 1, has found and adjudged you guilty of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and membership in an organization declared criminal by the judgment of the International Military Tribunal, as charged under the indictment heretofore filed against you. For your said crimes on which you have been and now stand convicted, Military Tribunal 1 sentences you, Carl de Gebhardt, to death by hanging, and may God have mercy on your soul. So Gebhardt's one of seven doctors who's sent to his death, and he is, after his sentence is confirmed, he 
was hanged at Mansburg Prison in June of 1948. And I understand that there was only one female doctor who was prosecuted at this trial of doctors. Can you tell us about Herda Oberhäuser? Yeah, unlike Dr. Gebhardt, uh, Dr. Herda Oberhäuser tried to make all kinds of excuses and explain away her participation in the experiments at Ravensbrück. She claimed she had applied for a job to be a skin specialist at a women's training camp, having no idea of Ravensbrück's true purpose. And even once she understood that Ravensbrück is a deadly place, uh, she claimed that the medical experiments were humane because the women chosen as subjects otherwise would have been murdered, which is not necessarily true at all. She testifies, quote, I do not believe that the patients suffered that much because they never expressed any kind of disagreement. And imagine the mentality of such a person who says something like that uh, in view of what she did. And like Gephardt, she showed no remorse at the trial. She's sentenced to 20 years in prison. Women in U.S., early U.S., uh, uh, military zonal trials received, usually received, lesser punishments than their male colleagues. Uh, Dr. Gephardt actually only served a handful of those 20 years before she was released. And afterwards, she went back to work as a physician in Nazi, uh, sorry, in, in West Germany. So she's uh, practicing medicine again in West Germany, but she was stripped of her practice and her medical license after someone recognized her, um, it was a Ravensbrück survivor, in fact, uh, and reported her to the German Medical Association. And disturbingly, uh, having her sentence so radically reduced is, is far from unusual. We see this in many, many, many cases of, of Nazi perpetrators after the war, um, that she only served a small part. Um, a viewer named Kim writes in to say, what man is capable of doing to his fellow man is inconceivable to me. For those who were subjected to the experiments and survived, how did they deal with that trauma after the war was over? Um, I, what would you say? I, I can't speak for everyone because of course there's a wide swath of victimhood. Um, 20,000 people uh, were subject to some sort of forced medical experimentation and inhumane medical experimentation. Uh, but clearly these women came together, as we'll see, we've, we've just seen that they used their very bodies, some of them to testify, and they came together to make sure their story wasn't forgotten. And I think that that has some redemptive value, that that is a way of coping with the enormous trauma, the disfigurement, uh, the mental anguish that must have come with uh, with this suffering. Uh, so I think that that was a very creative way to deal with this trauma on the part of the rabbits. And more than a decade after uh, the trials, after the end of the war, uh, there was also some kind of flurry of public attention that happened when an American philanthropist named Carolyn Faraday learned about the rabbits and learned about what had been done to them. Um, what happened with Carolyn Faraday and who was she? Yeah, this is a picture of Carolyn Faraday. She was an, uh, an actress, philanthropist, and in the 1950s, she heard about these experiments from one of the subjects at Ravensbrück who had moved to the U.S. after the war. And at that time, she also learned that many of these victims continued to suffer uh, from their disabilities. And it didn't take long to, for her to lead an effort to bring 35 of these rabbits uh, to the United States in order to seek treatment for their injuries. And many of them underwent reconstructive surgery in the United States uh, and some treatments for lingering infection and other diseases caused by those uh, brutal experiments and also from prolonged malnutrition. And that must have been very expensive to bring over almost three dozen women to uh, arrange for medical care. How did she get the support, the funds that she needed to bring them to the United States? And what kind of an impact did it have? Right. In addition to her own funds, she enlisted the support of many people, including Norman Cousins. He was the editor of the Saturday Review. It was a weekly magazine, and he wrote a number of stories about them. Our readers might, our viewers, sorry, might recognize Yadviga Zido in this photo in the center, which was in one of his early articles, Mr. Cousins. You can also see, though, uh, that he uses the term Le Pan, this French word for rabbit, to describe the group of, of young women. And of course, Americans were empathetic to their cause. 
uh, individuals donated money and opened their homes across the country for women to stay while they were in the U.S. traveling. Uh, American corporations made donations, including the now defunct Pan Am, Pan American Airways, uh, which paid for their flights to and from Poland and uh, to, to the U.S. In addition to getting the medical kit they really needed, the women traveled around the country and spoke with members of the press, uh, the US government, they spoke to Congress about the medical experiments that they'd endured. And this uh, press attention, this public support in the US actually, uh, as I understand it, helped push the West German government to finally publicly acknowledge the victims of Nazi experiments who were living in Poland and other Eastern Bloc countries. Because until this time, there really was a, a distinction made between victims and survivors living in Germany and those in Soviet dominated territory. Uh, when asked how they managed to survive, one of the rabbits explained that so many of them fought to stay alive while they at Robin, were at Ravensbrück because they wanted to live long enough for the world to know. So they felt compelled to, uh, to testify and to, to show. And although, of course, nothing can take away their suffering, nothing can take away their wounds, many people have helped to ensure that their story is not forgotten. So we can learn so much from their experiences, not only as a strong group of women, but as unique individuals who never stop fighting for justice. So thank you, Patricia, for sharing this remarkable history with us today. I always learn so much from you. You're welcome, and it's great to see you. As we commemorate Disability Awareness Month, we honor the experiences of those with disabilities, both visible and invisible. And we remember the Robbins Book Rabbits, strong young women who refused to be defined by the pain or the lifelong disabilities that they were subjected to. Thank you all for joining us. You can learn more stories from the Holocaust era by following our museum on social media. And if you found the program interesting, we hope that you will share it with others. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Be well.